beginning of the year, um, studying the book of John, and we're in chapter 3, and I'm going to start with verse 22. This is about, today we're talking about John the Baptist, and uh, here's what it says. It says, then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went into the Judean countryside. Jesus spent some time there with them, baptizing people. At that time, at this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water there. And people kept coming to him for baptism. This was before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. And everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare, prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. And here's the key verse in verse 30. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. All right, you can be seated. Okay, so last week what we talked about was Nicodemus, if you were here. If you weren't here, those messages are online. But Nicodemus was a guy that encountered Jesus. He was a Pharisee, and so he was a super religious guy. I just want you to understand, like, he was way more religious than even I am, and I'm the pastor of this church. So, he, I mean, he was just did all of these things. And when he came to Jesus, Jesus said, you must be born again or you're not getting into heaven. And he was blown away because he, he felt like, like, what more do I need to do? Like, I've done every, I have this checklist. I do all these things. And you tell me I'm not going to heaven? And what he found out was that it's not about doing anything. It's about receiving the grace of God. And so a lot of people are blown away by that. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation to go to heaven someday. It's only by the grace of God that any of us get in. All right, so today... Uh, we're going to look at John the Baptist. We're going to look at his life and see some of the things that he did. And uh, so let me give you some background information about John the Baptist because I know how much you love history. And <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Um, so let me, for 100 points, who can tell me who John the Baptist's cousin was? Anybody know who John the Baptist's cousin was? He's a real famous guy. His name was... Jesus, yeah. Just, just yell Jesus out. Usually it's the right answer. Um, so John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. And uh, if you go back to the Christmas story and you know that uh, Mary's cousin, her relative, is what it says, uh, Elizabeth, she gave birth six months earlier, uh, six months before Jesus. So he was about six months older than Jesus. We don't know if they grew up together. We don't know what transpired between both of them by the time between the ages of zero and um, 30 years old. So, but they were cousins. And John, uh, John was a wild man. He's, he's really a man after my own heart. Like he's a man's man. He, he lived out in the desert and he ate, who knows what he ate? What was his diet consistent of? Loc he ate locusts with honey. I don't know what, anyone ever ate a locust in here? I don't I'm curious to see what they taste like, to be honest. Um, I'm doing keto, so I can't have honey. But I think I can have a locust. So maybe, um, anyways. So he ate locusts. With, and, and, then, and then he, how, how what did he dress? What was his clothes made out of? Anybody know? For five points. Camel hair. He wore, cam, he wore clothes made out of camel hair. 
Now, I don't know, like I was just thinking about that. I don't, I don't know, I don't feel like that would be comfortable. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that would be itchy. You ever wore something that was super itchy? Like, cotton's nice, silk, but uh, camel hair? I don't know. Just imagine putting on a burlap sack and wearing that around. That's probably what it felt like. But I don't think he cared. So uh, here's another thing about John the Baptist. He was, he was said to have this, the spirit of Elijah. If you know anything about the Old Testament, Elijah was a prophet in the Old Testament. And he was a, just a burly, kind of a surly guy. He, he, didn't, he didn't care about your feelings at all. He was one of those guys that he would just get up and preach. And he didn't care if he made you upset, mad. He, he didn't care. He told you what God wanted you to hear. He didn't care if you liked it or not. And he would oft, there were times that he went to the king and he would say, hey, you, you know, the whole you know, country's messed up because of your fault put his finger in his face, and so people were always trying to kill him, but, but so that was the spirit of Elijah. John the Baptist was just like that. I mean, he, he was a powerful preacher. He went around, he, you know, and, and people started flocking to him. Some people started thinking, maybe this guy's the Messiah, and he just repeatedly said, no, I'm not, I'm not the Messiah, but he's coming. And so John the Baptist would, like oftentimes there would be uh, Pharisees there, super religious guys. And in the middle of his sermon, he would just stop and point his finger at them and said, you brood of snakes, you guys are a brood of vipers, you're just snakes. I mean, back then probably couldn't get a, a worse insult to, to those guys. And so they were, he, he would just, you know, he, he was on them because Pharisees, while they were religious and they went to church all the time, they were rich and they didn't really care about helping the poor. And he, he was always telling them, hey, if you got two coats, give one to the poor. And they were like, hey, and, and, and they, say, they thought to themselves what you're thinking right now. Because everyone in this room has got more than one coat in your closet. You do. Everyone does. Think about how many pairs of shoes you have. John the Baptist would tell you, hey, do you really need all those shoes? Do you really need that many coats in your closet? All right, I'm not, I'm not trying to step on your toes. Let's move on. We will get to stuff like that, though. But John the Baptist didn't mince words. Like, he just told you the way it was. And he didn't care if you got offended or not, you know. So I like that about him. There was one time, in fact, this is how John the Baptist lost his life. Uh, he went to prison. Uh, for He got arrested because he went to King Herod. And King, King Herod, uh, he put his finger in his face and he said, you are wrong for doing this. Because what King Herod did is he had a brother named Philip. And King Herod liked uh, his brother Philip's wife. He was like, she's pretty, so I'm just going to take her. So that's what he did. He took her, and then she became his wife. And, and so John the Baptist, when he had an occasion to, he, he encountered uh, Herod, and he was like, that's adultery, brother. And he was like, you're wrong. You're sinning. You need to repent. And Herod did what a lot of people do. Like, I'm the king, man. You don't tell me what to do in my kingdom. So he, th he had him thrown in jail. And that's where John stayed. And one, one night... Uh, Herod's wife got, you know, everybody got drunk, and she was like, bring me John the Baptist's head on a platter. And Herod was like, all right, I'm going to make, you know, I, got, I don't want to be sleeping on the couch tonight, so I'm going to do what she says. And so he arranged all of it, and they chopped off John's head and brought it to them on a silver platter, right? And that's how he died. And so, uh, you know, but, but John, John was that type of preacher, man. He just told it the way it was. He didn't, he didn't care if you liked it or not, which I like that. I sometimes have been accused of that, I, but I don't, you know, I, I know someday I'm going to stand before God, and if you don't like my sermon, I, I, I don't really care. Like, I only care if, if God approves of it, so that's where we're at. All right, so I've got a, a few things, four or five thoughts about this passage as we move through here. So let's, uh, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. N number one is you got to understand that John the Baptist was a forerunner. And let me talk, I want to explain what this means, okay, because if you don't, if you don't get this, you're going to miss the whole sermon. This is, what, this is what it means. Go to the next slide. So here's the definition. John the Baptist was a forerunner, meaning he was not the Messiah. He was there to prepare the way for the Messiah. So here's the, the definition. It's a person or thing that precedes the coming or development of someone or something else. So that's kind of convoluted. But he was, John the Baptist was not the guy. He was there to announce that the guy was coming. Okay. It reminds me, it reminds me of someone who's an MC. Do you know what an MC is? So for 100 points, who can tell me what MC stands for? Because I didn't know. Yes. See, a lot of people knew that. I didn't know that. I looked it up. I was like, I wonder what that stands for. And uh, 
master of ceremonies. That's, that's exactly right. And so uh, it goes, goes back to, uh, you know, medieval days where, huh? Yeah, it, go, it goes back to medieval days where, you know, like, like my wife and I were in London a, a few months ago. And it's, everything over there is prim and proper and, and in the kingdom, in the, the castle. Like the king would come in and he would have a guy. They would have the master of ceremonies, ceremonies announce. And there was this big formal thing. The king is coming in, the king and queen. And they were, it's this big to-do. So this is what the, the language is. The, 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 the idea here is John was not the king, John was the MC. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, people wanted to make him the king. People thought, you're the Messiah. No, I'm not the Messiah. You're the guy. I'm not the guy. I'm just here to announce that the guy is coming. That's what this is all about. So let's, let, I want to move through this passage. I want to, I already read it, but I want to go back and kind of highlight a few things. And so if you pay attention, I want you to pay attention to some of the details as we go through here. Because details are important when you're reading the Bible. All right, so we're going to start in verse 22 uh, of John chapter 3. And here's what it says. It says, Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went to the Judean countryside. So they're out in the country. It says, Jesus spent some time there, uh, time with them there, baptizing people. So they're out there. Bat- people were coming to Jesus. They were getting baptized. Uh, at this time, John the Baptist was baptizing in Anon near S- Salem because there was plenty of water there. So let me, let me pause right here because I don't want to breeze over that. It, it says that they um, go, it, it says that there were, they were there. They went to this place because there were plenty of water. So I want to talk about baptism just for a moment. A lot of people are confused about baptism. There's a lot of people that don't understand it. A lot of people think that baptism saves you, that baptism does not save you. We baptize people, but the people who get baptized have already professed Christ. They've already given their life to Jesus. If they slipped and fall and cracked their head on the way to the baptistry and they die before getting in there, they're still going to heaven because it's not the act of baptism that saves you. The act of baptism is a public profession of your faith, okay? I know that seems grim. You guys, are, you, you guys always look at me like, man, he thinks about people dying. I, I don't. I'm just telling you, if that happened, like I try to think through all scenarios, plus lawsuits and all. Anyways, but we're not. So I'm just saying, like, the, the act of baptism is a public profession of your faith. It's a way that you tell the world, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I'm not ashamed of doing it. But I want you to understand, you got to listen to me. Baptism is, uh, there, there's a prescription for doing it, Okay. There are some people who got baptized as babies that doesn't count. I'm just telling you. There are some people that got, went to, you went to a church and they sprinkled you, that doesn't count. The word literally means, if you look it up in the original language, means to immerse. It means to immerse. And it's a signification. It's a picture of go, going down in the water and coming up of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches. So if you went, if, if you just got sprinkled when you got baptized, you need to come talk to me because we need to rebaptize you. That, that's how that works. Now, if you got baptized at some other Baptist church or other church, Assembly of God or, you know, whatever. You say, do I need to get rebaptized? No, as, as long as their doctrine lines up with our doctrine, then we will accept that baptism. But if it's like you got sprinkled or you got baptized as a baby, you need to get baptized. Okay, that's, I know that may, I already made people mad in the last service, so let's see if I can do that with this one. All right, so, so baptism. And, and by the way, Pastor Chuck teaches a class the Next Steps class, and he goes over all of that. So if you're interested in that. All right, so let's go on with this passage. Back to verse 23. It says, and people kept coming to him uh, for baptism. It says there was, uh, this was before John was thrown into prison. Oh, okay, let's go back. Let's go back really quick. Everywhere in the Bible where you see somebody got baptized, just to further make my point, it was always Usually in the Jordan River, but it was always in a place that had plenty of water. You know why they needed plenty of water? Because you had to go down into the water. So sometimes, there, this has happened before when I've baptized people. Uh, I've baptized some of you guys and like you, you didn't get all the way under and like your ear didn't go under. So your ear is not going to heaven. That's, I'm just telling you, like you're, you're going to get to heaven and you're not going to be able to hear out of your right ear because, I, I don't know, I'm just saying, maybe not, I don't know. I'm joking, obviously. So uh, let's go on. Verse 25. A debate broke out between... Now, you got to pay attention to these details. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So 
they, the Pharisees were always coming at Jesus and John the Baptist and going, hey, you're not keeping our rules. Like, like I know we got all the rules in the Bible. Remember, who remembers, last, I told you last week, how many rules were in the Old Testament Bible? Come on, for no points, because I told you last week. Close, 613. Come on, this is going to be on the test when you get to heaven. So you got to know that one. 613 rules, and how many of you guys think that's enough rules? Come on now, we, we don't need too many more rules. But the Pharisees were like, we're going to take the 613, we're going to add to it. We got all, they had all these ceremonial hand washing, and they're telling Jesus, you don't wash your hands before you eat, man. That's, I mean, that might, that's a good practice to do, but Jesus was like, well, I'm God, so I don't have to obey your, your man-made rules. That's how that works. So, so they were always, you know, uh, on them about not keeping their man-made rituals. And so here it goes on, uh, verse 26. It says, so John's disciples, I want you to pay attention to this. John's disciples came to him and said, came to John and said, Rabbi, which means, what does that mean? Teacher, okay. Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people, and everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. Can you see what's going on here? Like it's starting to become a little their click against their click, right? Our click against their click. It's it's like uh, seems like a little bit of competition. Like wait a minute, we had because John the Baptist was super successful before Jesus showed up. It was him, man. Everybody he was baptizing people, large crowds of people, and now he's baptizing people, and the crowds aren't as big. And like what happened? Well, some of them are going to that other dude. Which dude? Well, the guy you said was the Messiah. Oh, okay. You know, and so it seems like to, the, to John's disciples that there was some competition going on. Can I, can I just tell you that how I feel about uh, other churches in our town? Like, we're not in competition against other churches in our town, in our community. We're not. Uh, there are some great churches in Independence, and if they're preaching Jesus, if their doctrine lines up with ours, if they believe the Bible and people are being saved and baptized and added to the church, God bless them. And I really do pray for them. I hope that God blesses them. If they're reaching people with the gospel, I hope they keep reaching. I hope God blesses them. We're not in competition against other churches. Now, there are some other churches in our community that they're not preaching Jesus. They don't preach the gospel, and I pray that those close down. I do, I mean, because they, people are going to those churches and they're not hearing the gospel. They just think, just pause for a minute because some of you guys might bristle at that. But remember the Pharisee that last week, Nicodemus, was like, I did all these things. You're telling me I'm not going to heaven? There's going to be people that go to those churches and they were told by whatever pastor is there their whole life that, hey, you're good, man. Just come to church and, and uh, you're going to heaven. And they're going to stand before Jesus someday and he's going to be like, well, I don't know who lied to you. But it's not about doing all those things. You And the Bible says this. Jesus goes, many will stand before me someday, and, all, and I will say, depart from me because I never knew you. So it's not about doing things. It's about knowing the Savior. Okay? So that's why. It, it, but if other churches got, I mean, I, I'm happy that there are other churches in our community doing good. Because it means that, that God is, re, that, that people are being reached with the gospel. Okay, it's almost, just think about restaurants in our town. Like there's Mexican restaurants, there's Chinese restaurants, there's all kinds of, run the gamut, you know. You may not like every kind, but that's, that's how churches are. They're just different flavors and um, we're the Mexican restaurant, in case, in case you didn't. No, I'm, we're, we're, the, we're the barbecue joint. That's what we are. We're the, we're the little barbecue joint. No, I'm just, I don't know what we would be. Anyways. Um, we're not White Castle. That's, uh, that, that's all I'm going to say. All right, let's go on. White Castle's nasty. Anyways. I just found out who the Christians were in here. <laughs> I'm, joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. All right. Let's, let's go back. Verse 27. It says, so, so John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from, he gives it from heaven. He says, you yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. So just really quick, I just want to show you this real quick. So it's John who was a powerful preacher and crowds were following him. He had his disciples and then Jesus had his disciples and then they had crowds. And it, there were similarities going on because John, they would hear him 
preach and go powerful, man. This guy, I think, is the Messiah. And he had to keep saying, no, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not the Messiah. I'm here to prepare the way for the Messiah. But and when Jesus got there, he started preaching, and they were like, and he goes, I am the Messiah. And they, they go, we believe you, and we also want to make you the king. Like they kept grabbing him, wanting to go, let's go overthrow the Roman government, make you king. And he's like, no, listen, that's not, not why I'm here. I'm here to be a suffering servant. Next time I'll be the king, but not this time. And so the, only, the principle there is that all of these crowds had their external expectations that they tried to put on John and Jesus. And you have that too. You have family members and friends and people in society that try to put their expectations on you. And you will do well to figure out what God says and just throw off those shackles and say, listen, I'm just going to do what God says. If you don't like it, then that's on you. You know, that's, that's none of my business. All right, so let's go on. So, so they, they were trying to say that John was the Messiah, and he kept repeatedly saying, I'm not him. I'm just here to announce that he's coming. And then in verse uh, 20, where did I stop? 29, no, tw 28. He says, you yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. And that's what he said. He goes, I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the, now look at this analogy he uses. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. So he gives, he gives the analogy of a wedding. So listen, everyone in here has been to a wedding. And on that wedding day, who's it about? Who's, it's about the bride and the groom. Really, it's just about the bride. Come on, let's just be honest. It ain't about him. He don't even care. He just wants to get to the honeymoon. Come on, can I get an amen? He's like, yes, dear, whatever you want, I will give you that. Let's get on with it. Say the fact. Come on now. We anyways, but on that day, it ain't about, it ain't the best, it ain't about the best man, and it ain't about the maid of honor. I've been to some weddings where she tried to make it about her, like the maid of honor. Always the bridesmaid all, all, or whatever. Uh, never a bride. Drama. But anyways, it's the people who stand on the sides. That wedding ain't about them. It's about the two people in the middle and really just her. But that's what it's about. So this is what John's saying. John's like, I'm the best man. I'm not the guy. Like, this ain't my wedding. I'm just here to support the guy, the wedding. This is what he's saying. He goes, so, he goes, I'm just happy to stand there and listen to the vows. He goes, therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. Who? Jesus. He was like, I'm happy Jesus is getting more people than me. I'm glad that that my crowd is going to become his crowd. And then some of his disciples, like he had inner circle disciples, those guys started going and, be, and to become some of, some of Jesus' 12 disciples came from John. They were like, uh, John's really cool, but this guy's the Messiah. And so they became his disciples. And John's like, that doesn't upset me at all. That's the purpose. He's like, that's the whole point. He's like, don't think that I'm mad that people are leaving me going to follow him. That's what's supposed to happen. And then verse 30, he goes, he must become, talking about Jesus, he goes, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. So I want you to understand just about this, about John the Baptist. He was a great man of God, and he was a, uh, he, it, it, it's amazing that he didn't get puffed up with pride because of his success, right? We've all, everyone in here knows, you've seen somebody go from relative obscurity to become somebody and the success goes to their head or you may have worked with somebody they're working right next to you and the boss comes to them and say hey now you're the supervisor and and what do they do they get a power trip people people in law enforcement not i mean when i was in bible college there were just people sitting next to me in the classroom and they got a job as a security guard and now they think they're barney fife running around with a stun gun i'm like bro you ain't a cop just calm down i'll choke you out you know no but uh, but i'm but people, people like that, it goes to their head. The power goes to their head. You've probably worked with somebody like that. Now, it's rare for somebody to, a preacher or, or, or just anybody in the world to gain success without letting that go to their head. And John's a person that said, hey, listen, don't shower me with praise. I'm just the MC. I'm just the guy announcing that the king is here. The king is coming, right? And so that's what it is. His, his mantra, his life verse was, he must become greater and greater, and I need to become less and less. I want you to talk more about Jesus and less about John. That's what he was, and I'm okay with that. And this is the message today. This is what I'm trying to communicate to you. Your life needs to be more about Jesus and less about you. 
And if you can figure that out, life will make sense to you. Life will, you'll get along a lot better. Let, let me show you this in John 1. This is about John the Baptist. We back up two chapters from where we've been studying in, in verse uh, 27, chapter 1. And here's what, here's what John the Baptist originally said about Jesus. He said, though his ministry follows mine, I am not even worthy to, a, to, to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandal. That was John's perspective on Jesus. He's like, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. I'm not even worthy to get down and take off his shoes. Like he's the king and I'm just a servant and that's okay. And, and so you, you just have to understand that that was the thing about him. One day, okay, so one day, a little bit after this, and you won't find this account in the book of John, but you find it in the book of Matthew where Jesus actually goes to John, right? We've been talking about baptism. And one day, John, Jesus comes to John the Baptist to get baptized. And I have this video clip just to kind of help you visually see this. Let's watch this. What you are doing is right. Baptize me. Now, I don't know if John the Baptist had dreadlocks, but uh, yeah, maybe he did. I don't know. It's, uh, I, I'm not sure. But the thing, this is what I want to try to communicate to you today about John the Baptist. He was a humble guy. He was, he was a person marked by humility. Even though he was super successful, he was marked by humility. So in your notes, the second thought that I have about this, just write this down. John was humble because he had the proper perspective on life. I want you to think about that. Uh, I want you to think about uh, from the perspective of like movies. In a movie, there's the lead character, right? And then there's a bunch of supporting cast. And John understood, I'm not the lead character. I'm not, I'm not the main character in this movie called Life. I'm just a supporting cast. And I'm okay with that. And so I was thinking about that this week. And I came across this. Uh, I was thinking there's a commercial. And I couldn't think of it. So I Googled it. I was like, there's a commercial that talks about this that I've been seeing on TV. And then I found it on YouTube, and I want to show it. You've probably seen this. This is a hilarious clip. Let's watch this. Can I ask you a question? Am I out of focus? You're fine. Yeah, but I mean, look at me. I'm all, I'm all blurry. You know? You're a supporting cast. What? The camera focuses on the most important character, which is me. Well, what if my character had a big reveal? Like what? Like maybe I'm the killer. Are you? Yeah. No. Could have been. I just thought it was funny, and it makes the point. You probably didn't think you were going to see an Apple commercial when you came to church today, but um, 
and I get no money for showing their commercials. I don't know. Mary Beth, we need to call them and tell them we want some royalties. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know. Um, anyways, so just understand, J John understood that he's not the main character. He's supporting cast. You need to understand in your life, you're not the main character. You are supporting cast. A lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people have a hard time with that. But you, you got to understand that it's not about you. There, there are some people, uh, you've probably seen this too. I, I, I've seen through the years some people who... Um, they will tell story. They'll tell stories, and at the end of every story, they end up being the hero of the story. You ever seen anybody like that? And I think everyone I've ever known that does that, it's usually a subconscious thing. Like they don't realize they're doing it. But I know it comes out of a place where there's there's low self-esteem. Like they just they don't realize it, but they they don't think that highly of themselves. So they gotta at the end of every story, they gotta make themselves. I'm the guy. Like look what I did. Even and it could be a humble brag. It could be oh yeah, I was helping somebody and and then but and then you're the hero. And I'm just telling you, at the end of all of your stories, at the end of your life, you can't be the hero. You're you're just a, you're not Batman, you're Robin. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you've got to be the supporting cast. Um, so let me, let me talk about this next, number three. The, the key to humility is to have a balanced perspective, okay? I want to talk about this because this is super important. So what's the opposite of pride? Hum, you would say humility, and it, and it probably is. I would say pride, the opposite is humility. But on a spectrum, if I was to just show you this, like on one side you have pride, and, and I want to just caution you against extremes. So, so on one side is pride, and this is a person who's proud, arrogant, puffed up with pride, like, like they're a good athlete or they're, they're good at whatever they do, and they let you know it, right? That you can just see it in their eyes and the way they care. Pride. The Bible says that God hates pride more than anything. And you might be confused about that. But God can, God can deal with a murderer. God can deal with someone who's committed crimes. God can deal, he, he can take people in prison and do something with them. He can't do something with anyone who's prideful. You, you might be a church member and go, on, I, I'm proud of my church membership or whatever. And what that does is you're stiff arming God when you're proud. And God, you just read the Bible. The, the Bible talks about how God hates that more than anything else. Because... Uh, because pride means you don't need God in your life. You're just like, I got this. I don't, I'll let you know if I need you. And God wants to be a part of your life. Well, on the, the other extreme, the other end of the spectrum is not humility. It's, it's, it's like low self-esteem. It's, it's you going, eh, I'm really nothing. I'm really not that, you know, I got nothing to offer. Woe is me. And you, you walk through life with your head down and you're like, I'm just a miserable worm. I've got no value. That's the opposite of that. Like those are the two extremes. God doesn't want you to live, he doesn't want you to be proud. He also doesn't want you to be that way because that's pride too. Because this person, God sees pride. When God looks down, he sees pride and he sees pride because that's pride going, I don't think God loves me. I'm really got nothing to offer the world. That's pride. That's pride. You're, you're stiff arming God because God wants you to be somewhere in the middle, where, which is humility. And that's having a balanced perspective. It's understanding that, yes, in myself, I've got nothing good to offer. But dang it, I'm a child of God. I was created in the image of God. So there is good in me because God sees good in me. And it's not me that he sees. He sees his reflection in me. His created in the image of God. Everyone in here is created in the image of God. And so you have value and worth, not because I say you have worth, but because God looks at you and he sees your worth. And your worth is, you are worth so much that Jesus came to earth to die for you. God sent his one and only son to come for you. That's how valuable you are. So you may not think much of yourself, but God thinks very highly of you. Now, don't let that turn into pride and go, hey, look at me. I really am somebody. Balance. You need to balance that perspective. Let me show you this. Go to the next slide. A couple of quotes here. This is from C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Think about that. Just let that sink in. That's what he's talking about. That, that's what I'm talking about. It's not thinking less of yourself and I'm just a worm, I've no, got nothing good to offer. No, no, it's just not focusing on myself so much. The next one is good too. This is from John Wooden, famous basketball coach. You are no better than anyone else and no one is better than you. That's what he used to tell his players. Like, like just think about that. Like there's... 
you know, no one in this world is better than you. Just because somebody makes more money than you doesn't make them better than you. Just because someone lives in a nicer neighborhood and drives a fancy car and has money and fame and whatever, those people are no better than you. And you're no better than anybody else. So at the cross, everyone's on equal footing. So we should never look down on our, our nose at anybody. Don't, and, and sometimes people do this. You say, well, I'm not rich and famous. But when you drive by the homeless person out on the street corner, you look down your nose at them. It's the same thing. You're not better than that person. You don't know what that person's gone through that, where they arrived at that situation. So we have to be very careful not to look down our nose at people, and, and whether they're homeless or whether they're rich or whatever. Let's just let God be the judge of people. Here's what, uh, let, me, let me show you this next verse. Proverbs 16, 18. I love this passage, and this verse, and you know it. Pride goes before what? A lot of people say fall. That's, that's not really right. But, but it's pride goes before destruction and a haughty, haughtiness before a fall. Okay, do you know what haughtiness is? Do you, I looked it up. It's an arrogant look or attitude, right? And you, I say it and you know what I mean. Like I may not be able to explain it, but you know what I mean. You all know somebody who flashes like a haughty look. Sometimes you'll see it on the, you know, Later today, the Chiefs are going to be playing and somebody's going to be in the end zone celebrating and dancing and showing up the opposition. And all of that's just pride. All of that's just arrogant. No, Barbara, it won't be your team. Your team's at, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I saw her lean over and say something. I was like, she's a Denver Broncos fan, so her team's not celebrating today. They might be cheering for the Chiefs. I don't know. But I'm just saying. I don't mean to. All right, here we go. So listen. So... Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before fall. Uh, you, we all know somebody. You all have seen this before. You, you've seen somebody showboating and, they, and they're about to fall on their face, right? You've seen that. It's almost like God is in that. Almost like somebody puffs out their chest and goes, look at how great I am. And you're just waiting for them to fall over and break their teeth out. You know what I mean? Something like that. It's... It happens. I've seen it. I, there, I didn't tell this in this first service, but this happened one time when I was a little kid. Uh, we were living in Louisiana, and this guy was up on the high dive, and we, there was like a line of people. And this kid, he was just a kid. He was probably like 10 years old. I mean, he was just showing off up there, and there were some girls down there. He was, he was flexing and going like this, and he slipped off and fell down and broke his arm and leg, and and he wasn't laughing. He, he, I didn't mean to laugh. I don't know if I laughed because it was tragic. But I'm just saying, that's what happened. Pride goes before a fall. Pride, when you start to become pri proud and arrogant, you're headed for a fall. You just are. And so I was thinking about that. And I had fun with this this week because I went online. I went on YouTube. If you want to kill six hours, go on YouTube and just put in celebrating too early. And you'll see numerous videos of athletes celebrating way too early. And okay, I'll give you a cut, and then we'll show some. But there was some about cycling, like like a race where they're cycling. And and I saw several of these where the guy is in the in the lead, and the finish line's right there, and he's riding a bike, and he lifts his arms up, and the handlebars go like this, and he falls flat on his face, and they come riding right by, and they and he lost the race. Why? Because he's an idiot, right? Because you're, you're not supposed to showboat like that. Cross the finish line first, and then you can celebrate all you want. But he celebrated too early. I uh, saw numerous videos about that. There was one uh, snowboarding where there was, it was in the Olympics, and they were, this girl was uh, snowboarding and going some jumps. And the very last jump, she was way ahead of everybody else. So she thought she'd get cute and do a little thing, whatever that is, and didn't land it right, fell on her butt. And this girl came right behind her and won the race. And she was so devastated. It was like, well, that's your own fault. You're an idiot. Don't showboat. Don't try to show up the competition. There was uh, numerous ones about volleyball. Uh, and I like those. So volleyball, it's going back and forth. And there were, you know, spiked the ball. And it looked like it hit the ground or whatever. And the person got their f fingers underneath it. And, or I didn't know you could use your feet in volleyball. That was a new revelation to me. And um, so there was numerous ones where they spiked the ball and they thought it hit the ground. And they turn around and they're do literally doing this. They're, all the people over here celebrating and the ball hits them in the head. I'm like, you just lost that point, clown, right? So, so just you got to be careful. So I want to show you this clip, a, a couple of clips. Now listen, the guys in here will know this. When I say the name Leon Lett, 
Come on, Leon. You know Leon Lett. This was from, this is a clip from Leon Lett from, uh, and this, I stole this from a video on YouTube that was like 20 minutes long. All these different clips of people, you know, running to the end zone and dropping the ball too soon or just stupid things. But Leon Lett, this happened in, I believe it was 1995 in the Super Bowl, okay? The stakes were great. And this is what happened to Leon Lett. I'll give you the rest of it after this play. Fourth down and six. And right. Fumbles. Picked up by Leon Lett. Can he go all the way? It's a 60-yard run. He's being chased by DB. Watch out. Did he get across? No, they are not. That's going to be a touchback to Buffalo. That was not a touchdown. That was a touchback. They didn't. He lost the ball before getting to the end zone. And still to this day, almost, whatever, 30 years later, you ask anybody, Leon Lett, and they just laugh because that's what he's known for, doing that. Uh, fortunately for them, the Cowboys, they actually won the game, and so, uh, so I guess it all worked out. Okay, here's another clip, and I guess I'll, I'll do a little disclaimer. This is MMA, so if you don't like violence or if your kids are in here and you, you don't want them to see violence, uh, cover their eyes, cover your eyes or whatever. But this is the clip. This guy, let me just set it up. This is a fight, and, and the, this one guy is, has been showboating the whole time. And I hate it when guys do that. Because, you know why I hate it? Because MMA, unlike any other sport, like these guys are gladiators. These guys are warriors. Anybody that's got the guts to step into a ring deserves to have respect. You know what I mean? Like, so if I was a fighter, I would never disrespect my opponent because they had the guts to get in there. And, and people have died you know, people's careers have been ruined. for So you're, you're taking great risks by stepping in the ring. But this guy has been showing up his opponent the whole fight, just like dancing around, clowning around, and then this happens. It lands and then a jab to follow it up. Again with the jab. Oh! Yes! Always! So I... <laughs> I'm just... you want, Play it again. Play it again. Land and then a jab watch him, to watch him. It up. Again with the jab. Oh! Yes! Always! Like, you don't know how that warms my heart to see that because you might think that's bad of me, but I'm like, you deserve that, man. You, you should not show up the opponent like that. Anyways, so all I'm saying is if you do that, you're going to get your teeth kicked in. All right, that's all I'm saying. So anyways, let's be humble. Let's not be proud and arrogant. Because if you do, I, I know, here's what the Bible teaches in James. It says, God oppro opposes the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. So I, this is, I can't prove this, but I believe this, that when you have a haughty look or you're walking around with your chest puffed out and proud arrogance, I believe that God's going to stick his foot out and trip you. And you have it coming, and so do I. So we have to be careful. I can't prove that from the scripture, but God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So let's be humble people. And then you're right in the wheelhouse for his blessing. Um, so, all right, let me, let me close it out with this. Okay, now I'm going to step on your toes a little bit and get in your business and ask you a question. Okay, this is rhetorical, so don't answer out loud. But are you a proud person or are you a humble person? And the reason I don't want you to answer out loud is because if you were to shout out, I'm humble, you're probably not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's, you're, you're not. Um, because humble people don't acknowledge that. They just, they, you know, anyways, you let another person uh, do it. Oh, I got three memes. Let me show these before we move on. I, I don't want to forget about these. Go to this next clip, this next slide. Oh, this was the best one. I almost forgot about this. So talking about pride and arrogance, you guys know, know what this is? Gosh, I can't believe I forgot about this one. This is the greatest meme ever. And when I talk about proud and arrogance, so this is in the Super Bowl two years ago, Chiefs against the 49ers, and, and with 11.57 left on the clock, they intercepted Patrick Mahomes. They were up by 10, and they intercepted the ball, ran to the end zone, and they got this new thing where they put up a camera. They're like, if you get a turnover, come down, celebrate. And they all thought they won the game. Like it was, but then 15 minutes later, they were crying because Mahomes had the comeback, right? And so 
I could show you, there, there's numerous clips about doing this in the NFL, especially against the Chiefs. They don't realize Chiefs just play with people and they're like, all right, now I'm going to beat you. But, but just, how about you just wait till the end of the game to celebrate? You know what I'm saying? All right, go to the, go to the, the next, the meme that I have. Um, this is just a funny thing. Like I take great pride in my humility. Uh, go to the next one. Tell me about your humility. You must be so humble, right? So, I, and then this last one, I like this one. So this, the little boy asked, what is a fool? Is someone who doesn't understand their own limitations, like a person in an expensive suit who feels superior to the person that just repaired the engine in their car. Just think about that. Like that's, that, the person with the fancy car is no better than the mechanic working on his car. And so we've got to get away from those things and just, just be humble. So I asked you a minute ago, the question was, are you humble? And whether or not you think you are or not, let's do a little test, okay? So number four, if you're taking notes, go to the next slide. Number four is we need to examine our motives. This is super important. If you want to be a humble person, you have to examine your motives. So in other words, why do you do what you do? So let me give you some scenarios. When you help somebody... Uh, with whatever. You gave someone a ride. You uh, bought somebody some groceries. You, what, whatever it was. Why did you do that? Was it, did you do that because you genuinely wanted to help somebody? Or was it because you wanted the recognition for that? Um, why did you, we ask people to give to God. Give back to God, 10%. You know, so why, why did you give to God? Why, why do you tithe? Why do you give your money to God or through the church? Was it so that God will give you that money back tenfold. There's a, a lot of people that do that. They go, okay, this is like an investment. I'm doing this, and God's going to reward me ten or hundredfold. And that's not how it works. Like, we shouldn't give to get. Uh, God does bless us. It does come back, but that's not the motivation. So you have to challenge your motives. Like serving. Why do you serve at church? Those of you that come to church and you serve, and then you feel like, uh, you know, I, nobody notices. I'm, I'm you know... I don't get a thank you card. I don't get recognized. Nobody put me in the newsletter. Why do you serve? Do you serve for that or do you serve just because you want to serve God? Right? You have to, um, you have to take in the... Here's another test. So think about this. Think about your motivations and think about your, your feelings. How, how, how do you feel when you give somebody a ride and they get out and they don't offer you gas money and they don't even say thank you? Like how do you feel? You probably... I felt like well, I ain't giving that guy a ride home anymore. More, but why? Why? Like, why did I give that guy a ride home? Was it for the money? No, it's not for the money. It it, it feels better when people show appreciation. But if you serve, if you do something and you don't get the proper recognition or um, appreciation, and it makes you feel like, well, if nobody cares, nobody sees. I'm not doing this anymore. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. Your your motivation is wrong. And what you have to remember is that we serve an audience of one. And God sees everything you do. He sees all the behind-the-scenes things. He sees all of the times that you gave. He sees all the times that you helped someone and no one said thank you. And someday, it, it, it may just be that you might have to get to heaven before you get the thank you and the recognition that you deserve in forms of what God says are rewards. And God's going to say, I saw that. I, I saw all the times that you helped somebody. I saw all the, even though nobody else at church recognized you. Even though no one at your job understands how much you do for that company, I saw that. And God re will recognize you. He, he will give you that someday. Um, so we just, we serve an audience of one. So let me give you the final thought, and it's this. Living, this, because we've been talking about the sermon series title is living your best life. And so living your best life means realizing it's not about you. It's not even about you. Now, I remember as we get ready to close this out, I'm almost done. I got saved, I didn't grow up in church, so I got saved 25 years ago, and then I started going to church, and I started, my pastor was big on this, he was, hey, it's not about you, it's about God, it's not about you, and he always would talk about the purpose of your life is to glorify God, and that clicked with me, and I remember, this is just a specific conversation I had, at the time, uh, 25 years ago, I was, before I was married, I had a girlfriend, and I remember coming home from church, and, uh, and, and I got saved, and, and our lives went in two different directions. I started going to church and learning God's word and living that out, and we went like this. And still to this day, our lives are 
different like that. And, and, but I came home, and I remember, I don't know why this sticks out, but I just remember telling her, hey, listen, the purpose of our lives is to glorify God. And she was like, that's stupid. Like, why would I do that? Like, like no, I'm going to live my life for me. And I was like, no, the Bible teaches us that the purpose of life is not for us, it's to glorify God. And she was just like, nah, I don't, I'm not going to do that. And that's why our lives went like this. And for the last 25 years, I've tried to the best of my ability to live for him and to point people to him. And her life just went in a different direction. I'm not speaking bad about her. I'm just saying, if you're a person, I know Christians that live their lives not to glorify God only. And it's a selfish existence. And people will stand before God someday with regret and say, I didn't realize that my life was about you, not about me. Okay? Let me, um, I want to I end with this. Um, I did a funeral yesterday um, for somebody that none of you guys know. It's a, it's a lady, this family used to go to our church down in the city. But, um, and I've, I've done a, several funerals lately. But every time I do a funeral, it always just causes me to be self-reflective. Um, you know, just think about my life and go, what am I doing with my life? Like, am I making a difference? All of those things. And I, th and I always think, because this lady was in the casket, you know, you look horrible when you're in the casket. Everyone in here looks nice today. But uh, I want to close. I want to cremated when I, when I die. You know, listen. But what I was thinking about was on, my, on the day, there, there's going to come a day when I die. I probably have done doing. I probably got eaten by a bear or something like that. Whatever, whatever it was, and and hopefully some of you guys will come to my funeral. But listen, I, and I mean this. I'm not. I'm not trying to be humble. This is not a humble brag. I, I really. The goal of my life. I hope that when on the day that I have that I'm have a funeral and you guys come, I hope that you guys don't spend the whole time talking about how awesome I was. I hope you spend the whole time talking about how awesome Jesus was. Because that's really what it's all about. And so what we have to do with our lives, and I want you to bow your heads right now and think about your life. Like if your funeral was tomorrow, would we, would we spend our time talking about how awesome you were or how awesome Jesus is? And so the good news is your funeral is not going to be tomorrow. There's not enough time to plan it. It's going to be at least a week, but that's okay. You have time to make a difference. You understand what I'm saying? Like between now and the rest of your life, if you've not got this right, you have time to everything that you do, point people to Jesus and say, listen, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. I, and this is why John the Baptist was such a fascinating character to me because his life was all about, he was a forerunner. He was the, he was the best man. He was not the, the groom. And you are not the lead character in your life. You're the supporting cast. And I promise you, I know lots and lots of Christians that will never grasp this. They'll live their lives trying to be the main character in this movie called Life. And they're going to get to the end and go, oh, I guess I missed it. I guess I didn't realize that. But you have a chance to understand what life is all about. You're not the lead guy or the lead woman. You're supporting cast, and that's okay. We get to be part of it. Amen? You get to be part of this thing called life and what God is doing. So please don't make it about you. Please make your life about Jesus. And when we get to the end of our lives, people will talk about how awesome he is, not how awesome you are.